there everyone and welcome back to TNO, the last season of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, and right now, we need to talk about expanding the party. Bogan Dorziev and his friends gathered around the beaten TV in the village pub, watching the American cowboy movie with wide eyes. Certainly the Komosol, or Komsomol leadership wouldn't approve of the hooliganism of watching Western movies, but this kind of media was seldom shown on the channels in such a remote part of Siberia. So they decided to treat themselves tonight. So engrossed were they in the gunslinger's heroics that they didn't notice one of the cell administrators, Serafim Vasilyev, approaching him. Comrade Dorziev Vasilyev shouted. Comrade Vasilyev, I, uh... Bulgan began to stammer as he was caught red-handed at the pub watching an American movie. No need to worry, comrade. I was just going to say that Sablin has loosened restrictions of party membership for the Komsomol members. You can watch your American media all you want as long as you can understand the principles of socialism. Really? Bulgan smiled as he heard those words? Yes, comrade. Also because of the Odan Ulan Uda's new affirmative action policy of Bharats, and other natives are receiving top priority for party membership. Because of your knowledge of dialectical materialism and the new program. I'm happy to say that you're the first recipient of the party membership in the party. Bulgan's friends burst into cheers and congratulations upon hearing the news. Drinks are on me tonight, he shouted. But just remember, Vasilyev added, Saba may have also lifted some of the restrictions on drinking, but you still need to drink responsibly. There are more heroes than on the screen, and we're doing the Komsomol Rabon. I'll be honest, I can't remember if I read this one yesterday, so... Uh, yeah. The original young pioneers in Komsomol were founded to help... <clears throat> The values of the Communist Party reached the younger generations of Russia. Komsar Sablin himself was once a member, as were many of the idealist officers who joined his revolt. By reviving the Komsomol, we can bring a new generation of Siberian children into the party and create a new generation that loves your ideals above, above all. Now, I don't want to do this one yet just because that hurts our political power, but this one down here does give us more political power and reduces the strain, so the I guess we have to do the Korang Izaltsia. Uh, Koren Zaltsia, or setting down roots, was a policy of the early Soviet Union that sought to bring minorities into the governments of the various Soviet republics. Here in the Far East, such issues of political representation have long been a thorn in the side of many warlords. We can do better. By bringing more Berats, Yakuts, and other peoples into the government, we can create a truly pluralistic union while challenging old chauvinistic ideas and ensure the loyalty of our union's desperate people. Very good. Very, very good. Let's keep working on this and keep working on our doctrines. Uh, well, I do want to keep doing doctrines, but uh, industry first, industry first. Even though we really should probably do our doctrines. We really should. Because we are really not going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, uh, well, the Commonwealth of Siberia, probably. I do want to expand this a little bit more. Just keep building for now, I suppose. That's fine. Look at that. Yes. Keep building. Keep building. So I'll pay off eventually. At least for the love of God, we hope so. The new Lenin Levy. While the reforms uh, to the party membership process have yielded results, the ranks of the Communist Party are so woefully unrepresentative of our union as a whole. And decades past, the Lenin Levy, a mass enrollment of citizens into the party, helped to bring hundreds of thousands more into the governance of the USSR. We should do something similar, and weigh the application requirements for a large representative portion of the population this way. The workers and peasants of the Far East can truly see themselves in the government and in the political life of the nation. Followed up with defeating child vagrancy. The bloody wars of years past and the grinding poverty of life in remote lands have not been kind to the children of Siberia. Many are homeless, many more destitute, and almost all are illiterate. <clears throat> We have an opportunity to bring these children out of the squalor, building new institutions of education and development will allow the youth of the Far East to create better lives than they could have under the rule of petty warlords and autocrats. But heated discussion was occurring today in the chambers of the Central Committee, and Sovereign could swear the tension in the room could be cut with a knife. The topic was the rights of homosexuals, which naturally drove quite a rift between the more socially conservative members of the committee and those that wanted Baratia's social reforms to be more far-reaching. However, Sovereign already made his decision on what position to take, unknown to the committee, and all that remained was to reveal it to them. Comrade Sovereign, what do you think? Braun asked him suddenly. The the discussion started to die down as the committee turned to look at Sodom. You've been rather quiet this whole time. I wanted to give you all a chance to voice your thoughts first, but my mind remains unchanged. Sodom replied firmly, We will follow in the footsteps of Lenin and maintain the current position. Decriminalization will be continued, but no more. There were audible grumbles and contemptuous mutters from those who had wanted to secure greater rights for the homosexuals, which sat as Sodom for a moment. However, one cannot lead without at least disappointing some people, leading to make Lenin proud. Ah, uh, yes. Leadership always requires tough choices. Always, always, always. And we're still building up, which is very nice as well. Hopefully we can just keep building, 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 because our equipment is not great. It really is not great. It could be a lot worse, actually. We still have this many divisions, which is not awesome, but oh well. And are we done building up any more? We currently get... Point four six every day. That is incredibly sad, I'll be honest. Incredibly sad. So we're done with that, so now we can work on poverty. Finally. So do we want to do a centralized education system? Or do we want to do rely on autonomous organizations? Well, we'll do the, the other one. We're not doing this one, even though I want the political power. But if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. So, 
centralize the education system. In order to secure and uplift the next generation, we must ensure that our education system is not top notch. The hardliners of the party have proposed creating a new centralized education system composed of state run schools that teach from state supported curricula. Such a system would have a number of potential benefits. Students would learn what we prioritize, and the long term destabilization effects of a diffuse education system would likely be avoided. This, however, would surely be a more controversial choice for many nationalities and regions who are used to having a measure of autonomy. Eh, but they'll get used to it, right? Rapidly improve academic base and get more authority and socialism. What's not to love, my friends? What's not to love? Economics would be good to do as well. Literacy programs. When the f fisherman came back, his c castle had turned back into a hut. The end. Fyodor Oblonsky closed a book, looking up to Mr. Chernyshevsky, the leader of the uh, Yan Chukan's village adult literacy class. You're doing great, Fyodor. You're reading much faster this week, he said. I'll see you tomorrow. Class is dismissed. Fyodor put the book into his backpack and headed out of the room in the church basement, seeing his friend Yuri by the stairs. God, I don't know what Salvin's doing. Fidya makes us come here every evening, Yuri muttered. I have a farm. I have a wife and three kids. Want to go to the bar? Fyodor shook his head and headed out the church door, let him disparage it, he thought, as he walked back home. He could spend his entire day away from his family and farming the adult literacy class, but it would be all worth it if he could spend ten minutes using what he learned at home. Little Vanya jumped into his father's arms as they saw him coming through the door. Vanya, would you like to read a story? Fyodor asked. Yes, Papa. Fyodor smiled as he sat himself and Vanya down to the kitchen table, taking the book out and began reading. Once upon a time, there lived a fisherman with his wife. And Prolicult... Prolicult... Prolet cult, which I've heard of it before, I'm pretty sure. All workers deserve bread, but they deserve roses, too. In the early days of the October Revolution, with the new institution of Prolet cult took hold with state support, new art styles and cultural groups sprung up like mushrooms after the rain, giving the workers access to creative outlets previously undreamt of. We should revive this program both as a way to expand our ideology and to boost morale across the nation. State funding and resources will be given to artists in the cities, to poets in the countryside, to factory-based theater groups, and to many others beside. The glorification of the worker is our highest calling, and who better to make such glorious accomplishments than the worker themselves? Absolutely. And as much as I want to do this stuff, let's get some better arty, because I want to make sure when we get attack and we do attack others, we do okay. So we're done with all this stuff here. We already have the National Spirits here, so we can close out of this. Dreams of Freedom, thank you. So now, let's come down here to just... Slightly increased GDP growth, which is great and all, but we gotta help out the people who are living in poverty, man. If we don't help the people living in poverty, are we really doing our job? Of course not. And who died? Not really sure. Did the... Oh! Svedlosk. Nice job, Svedlosk. I'm kinda of pulling for Samara, but and then again, with, with West Russian Revolution Front, we might be able to peacefully reunify, which I I think that'd be kinda of cool, but right now, agriculture's looking really good. Not bad. I mean, this is actually really bad for these guys up here, because they're taking a while to unify. So, that's not bad for us, but still. Like, let them struggle, because that guy, that guy, that group has so much manpower, it's ridiculous. Oh, 20% is so good. Oh, my goodness. In the first Reform Party Congress, the All, <coughs> excuse me, the All Union, Communist Party of the VKPB, governed supreme over a vast stretch of territory. Our triumph is clear, but our path remains murky, however strong our ideals may be. The two primary factions that exist within the party. There are the Bukharanists, led by people such as Mahiv and Braun, and there are the nascent Salvinists, backed by people such as Pechuro and Ulanovskaya. They agree on much, but each faction has a, had an approach to governing that the other cannot tolerate. While the Salvinists, Salvinites support the ideas that our new revolution was founded upon, the Bukharanists may know what it will take to keep the Union alive. Therefore, to resolve all these differences, we must call a party congress. It will be composed of delegates from Soviets across the nation, along with at-large representatives of the party. The other nation and its leader will decide upon the direction that it will take on the road to liberation. Disable any further reforms. Cool. Stage 2 to Stage 3, Bukharanist economy. Which is not bad, it's, it's alright. A stage 2 Baharness army with uh, the army stage 3, which I do like more. You get more attack organization. That's really nice. I think that's great. Oh, look at this. Yay. Uh, let's get some more army professionalism. Thank you. And the popularity of government government increase. That's not terrible. It's not great. Oh, but you get more industrial expertise. That's pretty cheap, though. Infrastructure is not bad. I like this a lot. Escalate, because then you can get more agriculture, but then you can also decrease coring time. So when we take out Siberia, it'll be really fast. Industry is so, oh, industry is so good to get to as well. The academic base not bad. Equipment is really good as well. Uh, we need more manpower. God dang it! Why do we have to make so many choices here? We don't lose that. We don't lose that much political power. We still lose political power. If it was a hundred days, then it'd be worth it. But we do get more industrial expertise. But I that industry is so good. We need to research as much and as fast as possible. But equipment. I think I still gotta go with the equipment. The equipment's still pretty good to get. 
Yeah, it's not great, but it'll be what it'll be. But we'll go to economics of the first, or of the proletariat. Defending the revolution will be good as well, though. Uh, socialism is an economic mind of science. It was born out of the idea that so solution must be found to so few having so much, while so many have so little. A transition to the state where everyone has what they have earned is our current goal. Keeping an eye on the economy and our progress is as important as anything else. Right now, we don't have enough military industry. Our people lack housing, and we are nowhere near true socialism. It's time to get to work fixing this and other economic issues that plague our people. Trinket unemployment. Oh, it hurts our GDP and stability, but whatever. Reaching out to the world would not be bad. We should probably do that earlier on. Yeah, doing this as well would be very good. Because my goodness, we need we need bodies. We just need so many bodies. Economic direction debate. But sure, I remember the October Revolution. This isn't upholding its ideals. It's mere naivety. Braun worked in 1917. It can work here. This isn't 1917. Braun slammed his fist against the table. We need centralized organization if we want to see prosperity. As Soblin opened the door to the conference room, he found the Central Committee in a state of shambles. Each committee member was shouting at each other at the top of their lungs, looking haggard and worn out from argument. Comrades, comrades, comrades. No need to turn this into a shouting match, Soblin excited, exclaimed as he looked around. We're politicians, not children in a primary school. Okay, now, can you please tell me what's going on here? Excuse us, comrade Soblin. Maya Olanovskaya apologized. However, a dispute arose over the extent of the role of workers, Soviets, should play legislation. It's a shame so many of this committee are overly idealistic, Mikhail Machi grumble, but I think that we can agree on giving you the final say on things, is right, comrade? The rest of the room nodded in agreement. Excellent. We must all make tough decisions in these difficult times, but nevertheless, I think the obvious answer is that we must stick to the ideals that built this nation. Think pragmatically. Stick to the ideals. This isn't upholding ideals. It worked. Braun, it worked in 1970. It can work here. Hmm. I think... Uh, I don't think it really matters too much here for this one. I could be wrong about this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it really matters too much. So, uh, I remember this is a, it's mere naivety. It can work here. Ah, eh, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me not too much. So, as much as I want to go to the right side, I'm going to go to the left side. I know, I think I went to the left side before, maybe? I could be very wrong, but honestly, increasing GDP growth by 1% is better than this one. But I'm probably going to decrease interest rates by 4% too. But. So, if you're worried about this one, please go right ahead. The question of famine and maintain food austerity versus this one too. Nice. But we're going to go with centralized organization of force. True socialism is our goal. We know this and nobody doubts it. However, Marx has said there must be a revolution before socialism or even a dictatorship of the proletariat can be achieved. And right now we find ourselves in that revolution. We must defend our gains, and even if that means putting our dreams on for hold for now. At this moment, the people need guns, artillery, equipment, and trucks. We must provide them with uh, these arms. And just as surely as we must unite your Russia under the red banner. Not bad. I like this one a lot, but we just... <sighs> equipment, is, that's good for equipment as well. I like the infrastructure. I think that's pretty good. <sighs> Do that one first. Screw it, why not? We don't have enough divisions yet. Because we don't have enough equipment yet. Because we don't have enough manpower. Guns are looking really good. At this point, we need more artillery and anti-tank, so... Artillery, thank you, and anti tank, thank you. Hungry sides with Italy, economic growth direction. Comrade Secretary Sabin exclaimed as he entered the conference room of the Central Committee. Do you have economic growth reports I requested? The Secretary of the Committee has nodded as he handed Soblin a large pile of papers. Soblin began to frown as he stared at the tables, graphs, and reports containing therein. Unfortunately, economic growth in the last fiscal year was slower than expected. Maya Olenovskaya, the Minister of Economics, said, We attribute this to a downturn in foreign trade. What does this mean? Salvin asked. Is there still funding available for the workers? Council expansion plan? Salvin had become particularly interested in a proposed campaign to give increased control of economic planning to the local worker councils as opposed to the bureaucracy, and have to talk about the possibility of implementing it in the previous months. Comrade Salvin, we can begin that project of yours, but for the foreseeable future, it will require that we focus on them exclusively at the expense of other vital planning bodies. Olenovskaya's assistant, a bearded man in his 40s, asserted, bodies like the National Munitions Bureau that our national defense depends on, what will it be? A uh, silence fell across the conference room of the Central Committee Sierra Salvin, who looked at the reports in his end, and waited for his answer as he pondered that classic question of economics. After what felt like eternity, Salvin looked at the committee once more and ready to give his orders. Guns to protect the workers, butters to fill their stomachs, guns to protect the workers. We love guns, yes. We love guns. 
Um, I love the military factories because we need them, but poverty is more important. Rebuild the trusts. Despite their similar names, trusts and the Soviet Union were not vast capitalist monopolies, crushing any outsiders and making people pay exorbitant prices. Rather, they are merely organized groups of factories or enterprises, consolidating along the vertical or horizontal lines, bringing them back because obviously a, a top priority. And this way, we can easily group private operations together and also more easily apply governmental regulations and supervision. Better poverty, increase GDP and GDP growth by 300 million and, and 2%. That's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not bad. Yeah, that's really not bad at all. Because right now we're at five percent versus twelve percent, so oh five point seven. That's not that's not bad either. Man. That's not bad. Let me build the trusts. But then of course we're going to prioritize military efforts. A few more debt, a little bit more debt. Four more military factories is not too bad. But let's make sure we keep spending more for cities because those are super important. The development of the Red Army is our top priority and concern, outweighing any civilian requirements. Thus, our efforts must, be, must go to it. That's not to say other requirements will be entirely ignored. They will just have to make do with what is absolutely necessary. Any other funds we can spare must go towards producing more weapons for our forces. The people understand that this is just as well as, well as we do. If we secure a country from warlordism and foreign invaders, we will secure their livelihoods better than any social program. Excuse me, my voice wants to crack all the time or just burp or something. Oh boy. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, agriculture is really good to get. Um, oh, whoa! Industry. I was not expecting Samara to win here. Holy crud, Vlasov! I was not expecting that, but okay. You know, we'll go with it. Why not? A single office, a single factory. Um, that's a, that's not, this is actually pretty good to do. So, when the majority of the people begin independently and everywhere to keep such accounts and exercise such control over the capitalists. And now convert it into employees, and over the intellectual gentry who preserve the capitalist habits, this control will readily will really become universal, generally and popular, and there will be no getting away from it. There will be nowhere to go. The whole of the society will have become a single office and a single factory with equality of labor and pay. Oh yes, please, yes please, just keep building. I know this is tough, guys. Just keep building for now, though. We have 1,700 guns. I think we can lower this by at least one, probably. That's good, that's good, 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 good. Get some more defense, please, for the love of God. And keep, we gotta do some land auction too, so. A single office, a single factory. Narco, Fim. Oh yes, even more poverty. I want, I want to get this political power, guys, I really do, but we gotta wait, or for the other one too. Um, yeah. The Narcom Finn building in Moscow was a renowned experiment in communal housing. A large compartment, apartment complex for families, it offered shared kitchens and laundry. The design was meant to intervene in the inhabitants' everyday lives and instill communal and social values. It was also a renowned constructivist and avant-garde design. No, the design was never widely adopted. That doesn't mean we can't do the same thing. We'll have the plans and we'll build twin structures of this building all over the east. Yes. Nice. Did poverty get better? Oh, that's, that's what we like to hear. Poverty will improve. Uh, pragmatist, all right. So it's not bad. Finally, we're actually doing okay-ish here. Not great, but okay-ish. Uh, Basicization. We get more consumer goods, more output, which is going to be so important. Uh, I've not done research facilities at all, which is kind of disappointing, but whatever. Whatever. Yeah, the question of famine. Oh, let's get that one first. You know, I'm going to wait to get 50 political power first, so then we can do some more stuff here. Um. Yeah, let's do research facilities. We haven't touched that one just yet. The question of famine. The union is ill. Bandits, warlords, and foreign powers control uh, control prower lands. Even our bastions are not safe from instability and catastrophe. The most visible way this manifests itself is in the food supply. <coughs> Excuse me. Our people cry out for bread, and there's not enough available. This is a hard choice, as we only have a limited supply of money available. We can provide relief, but it comes at a cost for our industrial investments. We can tell our people to tighten their belts and get on with the job instead. An option that hardly anyone can stomach still. We must choose, because otherwise we won't have a plan at all. The democracy imposed at gunpoint. So the WRF was not the last group that they had to take out, but Communal Blues. Gosh darn it, Vasily Eli grumbled, looking across his mess of the kitchen. Well, it wasn't really his. He and his fiancée had been provided with lodging in the communal apartments, but sadly they had to share the kitchen with several other families. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Vasily. Vasily rarely used the kitchen, as he was really home, spending most of his evenings out drinking with his buddies and doing god knows what else. But whenever he was home, he left the kitchen in a state like a hurricane and had come through. For a plate of scrambled eggs, he had left a sizable puddle of milk on the floor, three broken plates in the sink, and a wayward slice of bread that had somehow ended up unreachable on top of the ceiling fan. How do you make such a mess? Ellie went to fetch a broom to knock the bread off the ceiling fan, calling out to his fiancée, Hey, Aktia, Vasily did it again. 
Gosh darn it, but Atya shuffled down the stairs, placing her hands on her hips as she entered the kitchen waiting, whistling. He really doesn't know how to outdo himself, doesn't he? She continued as he began fishing. She began fishing the broken plates out of the tank, or out of the sink. At least in Habin. The rats in the tenements didn't leave little puddles of milk lying around. This, uh, that isn't funny, replied Artya, shaking her head. We're lucky to have this place, a place that's nice to say, free from persecution. I know, I know. I just, uh, just a bit more privacy would be nice, is all. It'll come in time. I'm sure Vasily will get kicked out at some point. How the heck did you break a floor tile while making eggs? So as much as I want to do this one, economic growth, that's re that's just better to do. But it's 1% versus lessons from Sol Sokolnikov. So if you want to do about this, please go right ahead. So 1% is not worth it compared to the 4% lowering of GDP. So this way, growth will never hurt us, or debt will never hurt us as badly, but still. Grigory Sokolnikov was one of the first members of the Bolshevik Party, an economist. He put much time and thought into the development of the first socialist economy. He argued that a high degree of centralization would be necessary for the Soviet economy to recover and expand. Following his ideas, we can start centralizing everything more. If we command, then everyone will follow. The whole economy must move as one, with the proletariat in charge. Oh boy. Oh, oh do we make another division? <gasps> we made one more division, guys! Oh, yay! Happy day. But it's still probably not going to be enough. That sucks. Um, you know what? Industrial expertise goes up with that one. That's not bad. I do want to get more stability, but I do want to do this one as well. I just want to do everything, man. Why can't I do everything? I'm going to do this one next, though. Agriculture gets better. It slightly decreases coring time. I think that's probably best. Maintain food austerity or versus or provide relief. I really want to do this one, but we're going to go with this one. Maintain food austerity. This is the worst decision we've ever had to do. It's one that we regret having to do. One that will betray the people that we're supposed to help. That one may that may shake the faith of those who have trusted us. But we must make it, and we have no other choice. The economy is just too important to be derailed every time a famine breaks out. We have to regulate the food supply and institute strict rationing. We can only hope for the eventual victory to save the people of the Union. Only once we have achieved our goal can we concentrate on providing the people with food relief. Oh, we made another division too? Look at that. Nice. Very good. Um, you know what? Defending the revolution. No, no, we're doing this one. Reaching out of the world. We cannot hope to bring socialism to Russia without aid from outside our borders, and we'll have to accept it from anywhere else we can. So we must step out of the world and accept all help that we can, as long as it will benefit our revolutionary cause. One day the Russian proletariat will once again become the vanguard of global revolution, but first an international workers' alliance, an international workers' brotherhood is needed. We stand opposed to the national enmity and discord, to national exclusiveness. We are internationalists. You know what? Spend more on the military. It if you spend 0.2 billion more, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Just so we can start raising more soldiers, because we need them now. We need them immediately right now. Cool, there you go. More monthly population is good. Followed up with, what, the new union. Ooh, that's not bad. Ooh, that's not bad. Ooh, we got another city. I like that. Red economy. But, defending the revolution. We don't exactly have the strongest army out there. Our force is made up of groups of militia and partisan bands. We aren't an organized professional force by any means. Well, this is not an excuse for poor performance. If we're a group of, if we're a group of regulars, we'll be the best group of regulars you'll find in the country. We'll train hard in all types of terrain. This will have the best equipment. We'll have the best equipment. And train as many men as we can muster. And it'll be backed up by high morale and commissars to tell them what they're fighting for. They're fighting for a girl back home. Sure, we'll go with that one. Keep building, not bad. Back on the world stage. I would love to do this one, but we're probably not. Yeah, that's not bad. Cool. And there you go. So if you worry about this, please go right ahead. This was this one. But State to the wider world, Germany appears to be recovering from a four-way civil war that resulted from the death of Adolf Hitler. From the radio broadcast received from Germany, there appears to have been some student left-wing movement supporting the reformists under Speer, but by and large, there do not appear to be any large numbers of leftists in the country, Otto Braun said. Pointing to Europe and Stalin shook his head. Monitoring broadcasts and gathering intel on the global situation was not an easy task, but the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had worked day and night on uncovering global events, and Braun was simply explaining the most recent updates. And what of America, Stalin asked, looking at the U.S.? America, Braun muttered. Following their defeat by Japan, it appears that the public is losing faith in the bourgeois capitalist order, with their opponents forming the National Progressive Party against a unified liberal republic and Democratic Party. Stop and smiled. I assume there are many socialists in this party then. Perhaps we can send our greetings to them. Brown was not so enthused. Unfortunately, while it appears that there is a good number of socialists in the NPP, there are equally large numbers of reactionaries and fascists who oppose liberalism for not going far enough. Both parties are divided over the treatment of black proletarians by the white bourgeoisie, and the situation is growing more stable by the day. 
and two men stared at the map and each other, and the two felt their hearts sink as they realized how alone the Lenin estate was in the world, and it is difficult treading the path of socialism in these times. I think in all times it's probably pretty difficult trying to be a socialist, but you know what? Maybe that's just me. There you go. <clears throat> the new union? Yeah, I'll have to go with the new union. I like to get the stability and political power, but it's not like super necessary. Uh, ooh, that one's not bad. Get another city, but that's only one more city. I'd rather get this up for now. Expand the militias. The militia system we have now was good for raiding neighbors and fighting against other militias, but thing, things have changed. We're now creating a professional army to compete with other professional armies. Groups of ill-equipped troops gr grouped together by locality with no regards to organizational structure are no longer acceptable, but that doesn't mean we can't tweak them a bit to make them fit. The Red Army as we want it is a professional force, but yes, but it is also backed up by numerous irregular forces in reserve. These will be caught up to fill the lines in the land of war. These irregular units are direct descendants of the militias, and they will fill the same purpose. They're armed rabble. Stop and watch with disbelief as the 44th Battalion struggled its way through the drills. Uh, his time as a military officer was brief, but never before he had seen such undisciplined rabble. Many soldiers straggled behind the obstacle course, creating jams or simply collapsing out of exhaustion. Perhaps a leader in the past, and indeed many in the present, would brutalize the men in a formation, beating and tormenting them until they acted like a perfect machine they wanted them to be. But Sobbin was not that leader. He walked up to the commander of the battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Novikov, who saluted him as he passed by. No need for that, comrade, Salvin began. I just need to ask, what's wrong with the unit? I thought we implemented measures to improve the soldiers' discipline. Measures, 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 Novikov sighed. Lifting, lighting up a cigarette before speaking, you just can't run if your boots are worn out. You can't shoot if you don't have guns. You can't train on what stuff you've got if they just keep wearing out. Know what I'm saying, comrade? Salvin nodded as he made a mental note to visit the people's commissar defense once inspection was done. What is worth the... I what is the worth of idealism in scarcity? And then prepare the factories. In the midst of the chaos that is Gulf Russia, we have struggled to produce enough weapons to properly arm our military. At times, it has seemed as if we had more partisans than guns. In order to prevent this from ever occurring again, we'll have to make further investments into our armed factories. Our soldiers will have to be sufficiently supplied, after all. Fighting an enemy with twice as many men as rifles would be utterly madness. Utterly madness. Kind of like tender madness, but anyways. Not bad. Well, look at that. We have quite a few more divisions now, which is awesome, 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 awesome. Whatever works for the re revolution, right? Combat schooling, you lose division mobilization. You get more division attack and defense, and more training level, though, but you get... Oh, this is really good. Discipline the men. Oh, that's nice. Less attack, more war support, okay. Alright, let's do prepare the factories through the hills. That's not bad, maybe. Yeah, this stuff is okay. Let's do the right side first. Discipline the men. <clears throat> The men that make up our army are daring and devoted, yet they lack the proficiency that will be required of them if they are to fight effectively. More drills will be required if they are to become the professional force they need to be. We're unlikely to ever be able to reach the levels of reliability that other warlords have achieved, nor could we ever hope to. Well, what we can assure is a proper red army, one capable of defending the principles and peoples of the revolution. If you want to read about this, please go ahead for this bread we thank thee. Thank you. That's awesome. Wow, they're just... Oh, these are the Mountaineers, huh? Yeah, don't bother with that. Ten combat with Jesus Christ. That's so bad. I know I could do being line doctrine, but still. Uh, stability would be nice as well. You know what? Get some more war support as well. Why not? Screw it. Discipline the men. Ready the commissars. Commissars should not be employed to shoot those who run from the battlefield and persecute men who refuse to become soldiers. Such practices would only force our people to live in fear of us, when we should be the ones giving them their freedom. Our commissars should not be used as tools of terror. They will be advisors and guides for a man, thus building cohesion and raising morale. Two of the most important factors we will need to improve if we are to sufficiently strengthen our armed forces. Nice. Rules of engagement, more leader experience gain, more war support, less division attack, but we already got more division attack because of this one, so... That's not bad. Yeah, this one gives us plus, what was it, 5%? Yeah, so you really get plus 0.5%. Oh, look at that. We should have more military factors, huh? Do we really need more guns? Yeah, I guess we do need more guns. That's not bad, actually. That's that's quite surprising, I'll be honest. Get a whole line going, then. That's fine. we got enough support equipment for now. Motorize is more than fine, I'm sure. Get a lot of fighters and casts. Cool, discipline the men. Ready, the Commissar has an ideological struggle. It's good to get as well. Partisans no more. That would be good. Just, just be like, we'll say this up for last, so. An ideological struggle. 
We have no reason to believe our soldiers lack the motivation to fight, but reinforcing their ideological fervor will only help embolden them. They will have to be reminded of the reasons they fight. Our message to the men will be projected loud and clear. You do not fight just for the Red Army, you fight for the revolution itself. Absolutely. Oh, poverty's back, yay! Well, poverty's back is not good, but we get more opportunities to lower poverty. Economic crash, thank you very much. I think we'll get through all the focuses before we finish all this stuff, so... We'll probably have to end up, like, me, like, finishing it... We're just kind of waiting off screen until we can come back together, so we'll see. We have to wait till 69 to get stuff done, so. But it's April 1st, so we'll see. Uh, poverty, please, 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 please. Better poverty, please. Oh my goodness, it's so bad. It's so bad. Nice. Followed up with through the hills. Our forces are extremely adept at fighting the harsh and peculiar terrain of eastern Siberia. Unfortunately, Russia is a big place, and it contains many types of terrain our local militias are inexperienced in. If we wish to win, then we must correct this. We'll find mountains and plains, however few in numbers, and send our troops there for maneuvers. They'll learn to live in unfamiliar areas, they'll learn to make their home, and they'll learn to fight in them. The enemies we face in the swaths of occupied Russia will find themselves confronted by forces as adept as they are in the battlefield. Pretty good. And two days left, so that's pretty good. Uh, points of a nine, that's not too bad. It could be a lot worse. It could be a lot worse. We do have high taxes as well. You didn't realize that. Actually, the budget-wise of what? That's 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 pretty darn close. That's I mean, that's, that's really bad, but... Over the valleys. I remember the hills. <clears throat> that was only the first part. Oh, my bad. We gotta keep spending. We literally have to just keep spending. Now we train even more. More exercises, more courses, more requirements, and we have the most prepared army we can feel, and it'll bring the revolution to all the lands of Russia. My apologies once again. Oh, my goodness. Or Max Factory is in the state, please. But we won't just have survival courses in our training camps. We'll also introduce new concepts to the recruits in our existing units. The implementation of armored vehicles will be a topic, as well as artillery and support battalions. Everything the old Red Army did, we will do, and more so. Even a militia man must understand that war is in a test of men. It's fought with weapons as well. And these weapons can give us, of course, victory. Now let's go back over here and keep going this way. Yes. Organization would be a great thing to have before we end up going to war with someone else, right? Right? Right. Through the hills, my friends. Well, no more Burgundian system here, which kind of sucks, but whatever. Nah, six and a half is not bad. Could be just, it just could be better though. Oh, look at this. That's not bad. We're going to get that better soon, that better too. Nice, nice, nice. Followed up with Partisans No More. Our Partisans were fast to become a feared force to face on the battlefields of Russia, but they were always plagued by disorganization. They've been lines without leaders. However, this will soon be changed. The Free Partisan Bands will be incorporated into our army where they can be better coordinated. We're Partisans No More. We no longer have to hide in the shadows. We can come out and bring the fight to our enemies. The revolution will be well defended and its people properly protected. Hired for instructors. Nice. And then we'll do Krasnaya Armia Vesk Silni. Because I want to rush towards that extra army professionalism. So that's just super important for us. Super, 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 super important. Every necessary improvement to our army has been completed. It can now stand as an indomitable force, a force without an equal. Our soldiers armor their rifles in revolutionary convictions. Sit fastly, await their opportunity to fight for a collective cause. Soon they will overcome all opposition and unite all of our people into the revolution. We're without a doubt that we are without a doubt that they will succeed. We can now look forward to the day our soldiers return home triumphant, and we can all live alongside each other, unified and of course free. Okay, maybe we don't need to spend any more because we got all the manpower that we could have gotten. And we're, we already have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of resources. But then again, we can't deploy any of these guys, which really sucks. But, hey, look, the Central Siberian Republic. You were the Commonwealth of Siberia for so long. Huh. All right, well, whatever. The Tempered Steel. And a new union. The revolution will not have to have a fresh start to its foreign policy, one that is more oriented around the organization of free nations. They may be tainted by capitalism, but they are the closest thing to the bastion of true freedom in the world. To not work with them will leave us at the mercy of the fascists and imperialists that surround us. We'll have to swallow revolutionary pride and make friends with the enemy of our enemies. Which is a never a good feeling, but oh, I've been into force. Well, that doesn't sound very good either. Oh, that's better. That's, I like that. Without cutting this. Um, we might be able to cut this and still do okay. How is this? Military is the one we're spending the most on right now, but yeah, it is what it is. You know, it is what it is. The port heavy machinery would be good as well. So then we can get a lot of political power here. It's not bad. 15 and 9. Well, we'll see what happens after we get the next group taken out, so. The Tempered Steel. The movements of the men of the 44th Battalion, were as they moved across the obstacle course, were less like soldiers and more like graceful but deadly acrobats. The troops moved in perfect timing across the obstacle course, leaping from hoop to hoop as it were born on them, climbing barriers as though they were ladders. 
He smiled as he turned to Lieutenant Colonel Novikov. I must admit, com uh, Commander, your new logistical program has worked wonders on the unit, the officer said. A soft and smile. The soldiers in the Red Army are just another kind of worker. But instead of getting value, they protect that value from the bourgeois thievery. Given, give them the decency that all workers deserve, and they will shine like all men can if given the chance. And proving material conditions create material rewards. Economic ties to the OFN. The Far is under control. We can now look into the prospects of foreign investment. This is considered less out of a want for letting the capitalist system bleed into the nation and more along the lines of being forced into cooperating with the capitalist forces. Let us surround us on all sides. The least hostile, most favorable of these, though certainly still not friendly, would be the OFM. And such a committee has agreed to send a request to the OFM to invest in the Republic. This will be not to be a permanent affair. When the time comes, we will abolish these ties when they are no longer necessary for us. For the good of the revolution, however, we must seek aid wherever possible. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Yay! Excellent. Go of equipment. A fleet of our own. The winter's wind chilled Valerie Salvin to the bone as he walked the makeshift piers of the Mogadon dockyard, hands shoved into his overcoat's pockets, his breath fading to mist as it left his mouth. His teeth chattered ever so slightly as he made his way across the pier to the small ship, anchored at the end of the wooden trail. Valerie had always loved the sea. His father had been in the Navy, and he once planned to join it as well in his youth. He remembered the summers of his childhood, swimming with his friends on lakes, pretending to reenact famous battles of war. That felt so long ago now, he thought, shaking his head. He had no time for this. General Secretary, the man at the end of the dock, Jens uh, Chulkov, uh, a newly minted captain of the Red Navy, saluted. She isn't much to look at, I'm afraid, but she packs a punch. The first Red Navy vessel built in God knows how many years. Valerie nodded. Does she have a name, Conrad? I'm told all ships need them. The man smiled. The men were hoping you'd be able to, you'd be the one to name it, Comrade General Secretary. Hmm, Solomon wasn't sure what to make of it. He wasn't an adm admiral nor a sailor, but if the people who believed in him desired it, then it would be done. As he walked past the edge of the deck for a moment, thinking the word left his lips so fast the captain had, had to have to wonder if he practiced. Storos in the century. Storo Zivoy. Storo Zivoy. A good name, Cameron. <laughs> oh boy. Red politic. I have to, of course, get this one done first. A civvy and get some convoys. Nice. Red politic. A politique. Of course, we can also pretend to remain enemies with the U.S. of A. While they're an evil empire, the deeds of Germany and Japan far outstrip their own atrocities. A friendship born out of necessity is what Sabin argued in front of the Central Committee, and they reluctantly agreed. A proper diplomatic mission will begin in order to coalesce relations between our two nations into something coherent. An American proposition. They were shuffled as the Central Committee began the meeting, starting with the same informal discussions that started every meeting of the committee. But this meeting had the unusual characteristic of having on its agenda the first order of business to be related to the recently arrived American envoy consisting of diplomats and businessmen. They desired an audience with the Central Committee in private. When the committee agreed to the conditions, the envoy arrived into the conference room. In fancy suits, the leader, a diplomat calling himself John Doe, thanked the committee for giving the group an opportunity that would be beneficial to both of our nations. Doe then cleared the floor, allowing for one of the most uncomfortable businessmen to step forward. <clears throat> I am a representative of the Disney Corporation, he said. Speaking Russian and my fellow diplomats proposed to offer an international exhibition that will show off the qualities of both of our nations. He then stepped his fingers and the two men came forward, handing out documents to committee members. The plan is for an exhibition in Disneyland, depicting Russian culture, and for another one in Magadan showing casing American culture. They will be run by their respective governments. The exact details can be worked out to both of our satisfaction. After a bit of questioning, Sabin asked for a moment of privacy, which the envoy respected. The uh, dogs are going to screw with us less. They'll screw with us, said a Sabinite. They'll fill their minds with children of li with lies. And whatever children's comfort eh? asked the Bukharanite, his voice filled with sarcasm. As the committee argued, Sabin asked Braun, is this worth it? I'm skeptical of its benefits. So Braun responded, it'll be certainly increase our economic output. After much discussion, the men were brought back in and given the opinion of the committee. We'll do it. Wow. That's kind of kind of wild. It's kind of crazy. But that's kind of cool. Unite the world in song. That'd be kind of cool. We'll see what happens. We will see what happens. So, oh, the American National Exhibition. Soblin walked down the streets of Magadan, his entourage of friends and loyalists still following him, him, following him as he inspected the various exhibits that had been set up by the Americans. He did have to admit, despite his skepticism, it seemed to be a genuinely good idea. Everywhere, men and women could finally witness the types of life they could have had, or could have, a life where kitchens would take the burden off a skilled, overworked housewife, where the clothing would be both beautiful and comfortable, and where a family could live in a big, comfortable home. Still, Sullivan had his problems. Walking into the art exhibit was like walking into the palace of a rich businessman, and the art itself was less than up to his uh, standards of quality. The music, while aesthetically pleasing, had an element of capitalistic worship, and did not even want to begin on the history exhibit that whitewashed America's role in the world affairs, and to say nothing of the treatment of the Negro. 
But overall, it was interesting, if nothing else. America's technological exhibits depicting the cars and planes were top of the line. After wandering the exhibit, he and the, his party met with some American executives. After introductions, they began discussing ways to get equipment into the country. Better tractors, medical equipment, oil drills, etc. It was a productive meeting and ended with all parties satisfied as to the payment of such services. Mr. Sovlin asked one, holding out a metal cannon in his hand. Yes, replied Sovlin. About to walk out of the meeting, have you heard of Pepsi? I do not think I have. The man extended the blue and white can forth, smiling, drink, I think you'll like it. Sovlin eyed it with some suspicion, but eventually took the can and took a sip. What do you think? It's delicious. Do you have any more? The Red Embassy. I apologize that I'm going through this quickly. It's just, at the time of this recording, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm trying to get through all these focuses here so we can so we can spend time asking for the entire next year so we can just start off in the following episode at war. The Red Embassy. The good news is that we're quickly th thawing relations with the hyper-capitalist Americans. The bad news is, likewise, still nobody's complaining that there's now a superpower who is not openly hostile to our regime. There's much potential to be found in such an offer given to us, so much so that we've decided to be be begin building an embassy. And once and for all, this will establish a permanent relationship. And be a significant step forward when becoming friendly with the U.S., for better, of course. For worse. The Far Eastern Exhibitions. Susana Pachura waved a fan across her face as she walked down the sidewalk of Disneyland, watching her or watching over the exhibitions. Sweat was pouring down her face, and she felt it in places she didn't realize could sweat. Why did Sullivan have to choose her of all people to come down here to this darnable hexscape? Couldn't even pick Braun instead? It wasn't like she was a big fan of the idea to begin with. She sighed, fanning hard as she passed by a Birat music exhibit. If there were one good thing about this, it was that Americans would realize Russia was a diverse place. Russia and Baratian culture often stood side by side with experts on the countries, making sure to clear any misunderstandings. She stopped in front of the military exhibi exhibit. In front, two soldiers of different genders spoke to a man. Jabbing a microphone into the faces. So, Mr. Vladimir, responded to the man in broken English. So, Vladimir, what is it like in your nation? Is it a place of diversity, a place where all men and women are equal? Comrade Sovlin led us to victory against oppressors and help free the people's east, or the east people. Michiro shuddered, walking away in disgust. She understood rationally this was important. The OFN needed to see they weren't a bunch of warlords and that they had support from the people. But this was disgusting. Parading her nation like some sort of commodity to be sold to the highest bidder. Was this not a violation of Lenin's ideals? Suddenly she heard a voice. Mommy, mommy, said a little girl. Is she a soldier? Turning around, Susanna saw a mother holding a child's hand. Yes, sweetie, are they not fascinating? Susanna sighed. Perhaps some good could come from this, if nothing else. Don you, Braun, don you. Not bad. And of course, the Red Embassy is next. Hopefully, they give us our embassy. Arise, ye victims of oppression. We have interacted with the Americans, but that shouldn't stop us from approaching the other two superpowers. However, this time we shall make no such attempt of friendship. As Comrade Lenin spoke, imperialism is a high stage of capitalism, and Japan soars at the top with degenerative evil. The Republic shall make an open declaration to all the evils of Japan. From bringing down the revolutionary hero Mao Zedong to brutally oppressing the workers of Asia. The contradictions of the Japanese Empire shall lead to its collapse, and the workers of Asia will see liberation. At least, that's what we hope for, right? Right? Right. We have a lot to build, my friends. We have so much to build. But by the time we start the next episode, we'll have pretty much everything built already, so. Oh, excellent news from the U.S. The government has accepted a request for a non-aggression pact and will be sending in transport aircraft to receive our envoys shortly. In addition, they found a suitable building in Washington, D.C. to serve as our embassy. While it is being renovated to serve our needs, they will be staying at a hotel. We're in out as a temporary embassy with numerous conference rooms in which meetings can take place in our diplomats' house. Excellent. Awesome. Get some more heavy machinery. Unite the world in song. We must take the final step. The banner of the revolution must not be disunited. It cannot be if it is ever to triumph, and that will be its founders, and the spark of freedom that was lost ever since our defeat at the hands of the Reich will be found and renewed once again. Soon Valery Mikhailovich Sovlin will find himself holding perhaps the most grand speech he's ever had to hold in his life, as he'll call upon all the socialist parties in the world to come and attend the city in the city of Magadan. There, Sovlin will proclaim the birthing of a new organization, the Socialist International. We will invite our ideological brethren to a conference to discuss international cooperation. Absolutely. Cool. And let's get some of that too. And let's grab some of this because we can. Good. We're building, 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 and we can build even more, which is I love. I hope you love it too. Because our industry is looking really god awful. And we are stuck with 20 divisions. This sucks. This really sucks. Oh, uh, what do we have over here? Ah, uh, show me that. The Red Twilight. Since the fall of London... Oh, if you want to read about that one, I've read that one before. So if you want to read about that, please go right ahead. We live in a childish fantasy, don't we? We live in a society. We live in a period. Um, uh, I think we'll do this one next, because I want to get that bonus to industry. Industry is just so, so important. 
I do apologize again for my mispronunciations, my very fast speaking, just because I did want to get through this episode. Uh, not relatively quickly, but, you know, quick, quickly enough. So, hopefully there's something here about the Socialist International, but I guess we'll see what happens. Junior Secretary Salblins. <clears throat> Remarks on the opening of the International Socialist Convention. Comrades, brothers, and sisters, welcome to Magadan and the Far Eastern Socialist Republic. Today, representatives of every socialist nation in the world have gathered here to meet their comrades all over the world, to discuss your issues in the world politics, to raise awareness of your individual causes and struggles, and to see for yourselves the progress and reconstruction of Eastern Siberia under socialism. International awareness is important for the cause of socialism. For too long, we have wandered around uncoordinated, aimless, blind issues outside our own countries, but the struggle of the workers is an international one. The oppressors of the world, from the mega corporations of North America and Europe, to the dictators of South America and Africa, and the warlords and aristocrats of Asia, all put aside their supposed differences to suppress movements of the working class in their own countries. We must have a means of defending ourselves. Comrades, the time has come to cast off the blinders of nationalism and to awaken to the world around us, to coordinate and to plan the revolution of the working class with parties and organizations around the world. In standing together against the enemies of working people, what we need, brothers and sisters, is not a loose association of what we need as a new international. Ruling socialist parties throughout the world will be approached with an offer to join the proposed Communist Information Bureau. But, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow, when we will begin with a lot of warfare. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!